So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Let me welcome you to our fortnightly uh, Radiology Without Borders uh, lecture meetings. And you're welcome. Get your pens and pencils ready and take some notes. But uh, we, we are recording the meeting for those who need to replay later or anytime. So the meeting will be recorded on the YouTube channel for Radiology Without Borders. So let me not waste much time and introduce our presenter tonight. So our presenter tonight is Mr. Gift Chilipo. Uh, he holds a master's degree in ultrasound. He also has a postgraduate certificate in echocardiography and he has a postgraduate diploma in ultrasound from Techno University in India. He also holds a BTEC in radiography from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. He's also a holder of a diploma in radiography from uh, Malawi. So his areas of interest include vascular ultrasounds, including mostly Doppler, Doppler obstetrics. Uh, he's also in, interested in adult echo and uh, cancer monitoring and diagnosis. So he's currently based in Namibia working as a sonographer. I think uh, the credentials speak for themselves. We are looking forward to a very and good and educative evening. Uh, without wasting much of uh, our time, let me give the floor to Mr. Gift. Mr. Gift, please go ahead. Thank you so much for that humbling introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, so as the moderator has said, we'll be talking about ultrasound assessment of uh, adnexal masses. Uh, those are my qualifications. You might ask yourself, why do we have to characterize adnexal masses? Why is it important that we categorize adnexal masses, whether they are benign, whether they are benign or they are malignant? Well, it's because a lot of what will happen to the patient depends on what we say in our ultrasound report. If we say that this adnexial mass is benign, then they can conservatively manage this patient uh, without surgery. Or if indeed they go ahead and plan surgery, then it might just be a minimal invasive surgery. Uh, but also for the patient, uh, when the patient knows that Yes, I've been told that I've got an adnexial mass, but this mass is benign. We can imagine the peace that the patient will have, right? reduced patient anxiety. But also in the long run, we're in Africa, the cost, taking unnecessary benign regions to theater uh, is basically re using resources that we should have used on a more serious case. So we are strangling already scarce resource if we just take a benign region, a benign mass uh, to fear. So that's, that's, that's the first advantage of us characterizing the mass, whether the mass is benign or whether the mass is malignant. But on the other hand, when we also characterize the mass that this mass is a malignant region, then the patient receives good help because in most cases that we can refer this patient to an oncologist, uh, a gynecologist oncologist if we have one available, or oncologic facility that they will be able to take care of this patient. But it also helps even in the surgical planning of this patient uh, because there's what is called seeding of the mass when they're doing uh, an excision. So if it's a malignant, if you told the, the, the patient, the, the theory to him that this is a benign region while it's malignant and they go ahead in removing it, there's a chance that while they're removing it, uh, they might do some seeding because they were not prepared 
to deal with the malignant region. So in the in the long run, we help in patient out good patient outcome as well when we characterize masses being benign or malignant based on ultrasound. But then you might ask, what tools do we have to help us characterize masses being benign or being malignant? Well, thankfully, we've got the IOTA and the ORADS uh, groups that have done tremendous work in helping us characterize regions, in helping us characterize adnexial masses. I'm not going to talk about the adnex model because this uses a mathematical modeling and it's it's quite complex. But the aorta and the ORADS is something else that I use in my practice, and it we can always uh, apply it in our in our setup. So let's start with the uh, aorta. Uh, these are just aorta basically stands for International Variant Tumor Analysis uh, Group, and these are go to uh, articles that I've attached here, uh, the terms, definitions, and measurements to describe sonographic features of adnexal tumors, and the consensus statement that the IOTA, together with the ESO, also issued when it comes to adnexal masses. Uh, these articles pretty much just brings out how should we describe a region? Uh, how should we describe an adnexal mass, for example? Uh, how do we measure uh, if we find an adnexial mass? So these are really good articles to go to when when it comes to uh, describing adnexial masses. The rules that we're going to describe in the first part of our, our presentation are based on the IOTA, as I've said. Uh, they carried out a study that its aim was to formulate standardized terms and procedures to derive morphological and, and vascular endpoints in gynecological ultrasound. A study was done, and then they realized that from one center to another center, there is no uniformity when it comes to how we describe ovarian or adnexial masses. One we would choose to use is, is on our own terms, another center tend to use their own terms as well. And that brings in management problem of the patient when there's no uniformity of the terms and uh, morphological procedures that we can use when describing uh, adnexial masses. So the IOTA came up with uh, a consensus team made up of uh, experts in the gyne field that tried to formulate terms that should be universally accepted. So some of the terms, for example, that they had to describe in their consensus statement are terms like lesion. What's a lesion? What's a septum? What's a papillary projection? What do, how should we describe uh, adnexial region contents? What do we mean when we say locus, for example? Maybe just to take one point home, for example, you've scanned a 27 year old lady and you found that this lady has got a corpus luteum in the ovary do you then go ahead and say there is a cystic lesion in your ultrasound report findings in your comment in your conclusion well if you do that then that's wrong or do you then, let's say you found a dominant follicle, it's measuring 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeter. And then in your report, at the conclusion, you say uh, right ovarian cyst or right ovarian region. Well, again, if we use these standardized terms, that would be wrong. Why are we saying that would be wrong? Well, because a region is a mass that is not in line or that is not consistent with the normal physiological function of an ovary. That's what is called an lesion. So if we see a dominant follicle or if we see a corpus luteum, these are consistent with normal physiological function. And so therefore, they should never be called lesions. They shouldn't even be reported at the end of the report because they can just cause unnecessary uh, panic, uh, for example. 
Just one example that I tried to highlight, but you can go to the article and appreciate uh, the other things. Maybe one of, one of the other terms that I can allude to as well is papillary projection. What do we mean when we say a papillary projection? Well, you've got a cyst, and then there's got a solid component that is projecting into the cyst from the cyst wall. When you measure that solid component and it measures more than seven millimeters, I mean, not seven, rather, more than three millimeters, then you call that a papillary projection. You will see as we go ahead why this is important. So you've got a cyst, it's got a solid component on the wall projecting into the cyst. You measure that solid component and it measures more than three millimeters. By all means, call that a papillary projection in your description of that cyst. If it's less than three millimeters, that's another thing. We'll see as we go ahead with the with our presentation. So these were terms that helps us describe these masses, these regions that we find in that nature, just to help us to work together as standardized terms. So you can go ahead and uh, have a look on those uh, articles that will really help us. But let's go ahead and talk about why we're here uh, this evening. We're here because we want to characterize adnexial regions on ultrasound, whether they are benign or whether they are malignant. And we have already seen how important that is really. Again, these are two good articles that can help you when it comes to identify, I mean, characterizing adnexial regions. These are based on the Iora group. The simple ultrasound loose to distinguish between benign and malignant adnexial masses before surgery, and the simple ultrasound based loose for diagnosing ovarian cancer on ultrasound, all written by uh, Dick and uh, his colleagues. This simple rules by the IOTA group uh, was really done to assess the diagnostic perform. I mean, uh, diagnostic performance that if we apply them. How good can we get when it comes to diagnosing adnexial mass being benign or being malignant? And so what the IOTA team did was they validated these five ultrasound rules that we're going to discuss. Uh, these rules comprise five ultrasound features that are called M features, like shape, size, solidity, color dopra, to predict malignant. And they also, con they also consist of five ultrasound features that are called B features to predict a benign tumor. So before they were just brought out for people to start using them, they had to validate them. They had to see how well do these simple rules work when it comes to characterizing an adnexial mass, it being a malignant or it being a benign. So they tried them out, or they validated them uh, in a study that was done in eight countries in Europe. They studied 1,938 women that had had natural masses. And the findings, the ultrasound findings using these M and B features, using these simple rules, were then compared with histological findings after tumor excision. Uh, the ultrasound had 70, characterized 72% 72 of the masses as benign, and it characterized 28% of the masses as malignant. And so it yielded a conclusive result in 77% of the masses with 92% sensitivity and 96% specificity. What are we saying? Well, when they applied these simple ultrasound rules, they found that it can conclusively yield a result in at least 77%. That's quite a good number. And so they concluded that the simple rules has the potential of improving management of women with that nature masses.
And that's why we're discussing them today. Because if we put them into our practice, we've got 77% chance, so to speak, of being able to characterize the adnexial masses that we'll be finding on ultrasound, whether they are malignant or whether they are benign. So what are these simple rules? I've already talked about that there are five features typical for benign, five features for malignant. But you might ask, uh, you say that it was only conclusive in 77%. What happened in the rest? Well, the rest were classified as inconclusive. And so basically, further imaging, or you can call on a more experienced person to have a look. But what are these uh, ultrasound features? What are these five simple rules that the IOTA came up with, the International Variant Human Analysis Group? So these are here. Sorry that the, 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 the slide might be very busy, but we'll try to uh, really bring the point based on this. The first five benign rules that you are scanning and you have this cyst in front of you, an adnexia region, is it unilocular? meaning there's nothing inside at all. That's a B1. Is there any solid component or is there any papillary projection? Remember our definition of a papillary projection? A component, a solid component arising from a cyst, projecting into this, arising from the cyst wall, projecting into the cyst, measuring more than three millimeters. So, is there a papillary projection? But if there is a papillary projection and is measuring less than seven millimeters, then that's a good sign. So we have got our papillary projection here, but they measured it is 6.5. That's a B2. That's a benign feature, a good sign. You've got a mass, but then it's called acoustic shadowing. That's a good sign. In our case here, like this lesion B3, benign feature. You've got a multilocular cyst, meaning a cyst that have got multiple locules, multiple daughter cysts inside, so to speak. But when you measure the widest diameter of it, it's less than 10 centimeters. Again, smile, that's a good sign, B4. And you've got the cyst, You've put your color flow, there is no uptake. And that is called color score one. That's a good sign. So these are the, the B features that the IOTA came up with. Unilocular cyst, a presence of a solid, presence of a solid components with maximum diameter less than seven millimeters, a presence of acoustic shadowing, a smooth multilocular tumor, but with a maximum diameter of less than 10 centimeters and no blood flow of the lesion. These are all classified as benign, I mean, rather uh, benign features based on the IOTA group. What are the five M features? Well, the first M, M1 is an irregular solid region. M2, if there is ascites, not just POD fluid collection, but fluid in the peritoneal cavity, if there is ascites, that's M2. If there is at least four papillary projection, or if there's a papillary projection that is more than seven millimeters, M4, if there's irregular multilocular solid tumor, with a maximum diameter now of more than 10 centimeters. M5, if you put color and there's uptake, strong uptake, which is color score four. Color score is, we have color score one, which means there is no flow. Color score two, which is mild. Color score three, moderate. Then we've got color score four and five, which means uh, severe uh, uptake of color. So if you've got a lesion that has got CAR score 4 as well, these are M features. 
So what are we saying? Well, using these features, using these descript descriptors, you should be able to get right with at least 77% of the masses that you meet in your daily practice. So tomorrow you're at work, eight o'clock, you found this lady that walks in, you've scanned this lady, and she's got a solid vision, irregular solid vision. And then there's ascites. Already you know which route to go. But how do we come about uh, these rules? Let's summarize them. How do they work? Rule number one, if one or more M features are present in the absence of B features, then we classify the mass as malignant, we flag it. If one or more M features are present in the absence of any B feature that we have talked about, then we flag that lesion as malignant. Rule number two, if one or more B features are present in the absence of M feature, then the mass is classified as benign. You've got an eight centimeter unilocular wall defined cyst. You've put your color flow and color score one, meaning there's no uptake of color. You know most likely you're dealing with a benign lesion. You've got a multilocular cyst, more than 10 centimeters with irregular walls. You've put your color flow and there's color uptake, color score three, more likely you're dealing with a malignant region. But then what if you've got a mass that is exhibiting both features in that case, based on the IOTA rules, you term that lesion, that mass, as an inconclusive, meaning they can go ahead and do other imaging modalities. Just using these, we have already characterized a lesion using ultrasound. If we have a case tomorrow morning and we apply them, then already we should be able to to get a direction. Are we going into the benign route or are we going into the malignant route? And it will go a wrong way in helping and managing these patients. So these were the IOTA rules. Let's now talk about the ORADs. The IOTA are pretty much more European based. Mm -hmm. they, they haven't really been adopted uh, in the American territories. Uh, in America, they have what they call the ORADs. That's what they use. Uh, ovarian and natural reporting and data system. Uh, this was brought about by the American College of Radiologists. So for the next few slides, we're going to talk about the ORADs as well. Again, like the IOTA, the ORADs are really based on pattern recognition. But they do provide detailed guidance when it comes to evaluation of almost certainly benign regions. And unlike the IOTA, the ORAs also do provide management strategies. So they don't leave you hanging. If you have a lesion, what do you conclude with? What's the management plan? The ORAs provides that as well. They, the ORADs have an approach like the BIRADs that we use in breast ultrasound or the, the TIRADs that we use in thyroid ultrasound. So based on expert opinion, they came up with six categories of risk classification when it comes to adnature regions. ORAD zero, which basically means an incomplete evaluation. ORADs 1, which basically mean a normal premenopausal ovary. ORADs 2, an almost certain benign lesion. ORADs 3, a low risk of malignancy. ORADs 4, intermediate risk. 
of malignancy. And then ORAT5, which is the higher end, the higher risk of malignancy. I just copied this from the ORAT's uh, consensus statement. You should be able to get it. I'm not going, to, it's quite busy, so I'm not going to, uh, to go into detail with it. But suffice to say, it does provide the categories I've talked about, the risk uh, the risk category, the lexicon descriptors, how do you describe the mass, and the, the management, as I've said, uh, of the region. So let's go into this detail. The ORAT one, well, based on the ORATS group, if you have a corpus luteum, again, remember from our definition of a lesion, so we're not going to call that a lesion. It's not a lesion. It's a corpus luteum because it's in line with the normal physiological function of the ovary. So if you've got a corpus luteum, or if you've got a dominant follicle that is less than three centimeters, based on ORAS, you don't even have to put that in your conclusion. You can put it in the body of your report. There's a dominant follicle in the left in the left ovary measuring 2.5 centimeters by 2.8 centimeters, or at one. That's a normal ovary. No need to cause any panic. What about ORAS two? The almost certain benign lesions that have got less than one percent likelihood of being malignant. Well, these are anechoic cysts or simple cyst in premenopausal women, be measuring between three centimeters and 10 centimeters, or any cyst that is less than 10 centimeters in postmenopausal women as well. Simple cyst. These are categorized as ORAS2. Any non simple unilocular cyst with smooth inner margin is also characterized as an ORADS2 region. Uh, in this case here, non simple implies when internal echoes or incomplete septa are present in the cyst. But if this cyst is it's got smooth margin, whether it's not simple, but it's measuring less than 10 centimeters smooth margin, then we go ahead and classify that as an ORADS2. If you marry this with the iota, this will pretty much be B features as well. Still in uh, ORADS2 category, we've got the classic benign regions. For example, a typical hemorrhagic cyst that is measuring less than 10 centimeters, that is an ORAD2. A typical demoid cyst measuring less than 10 centimeters, that is an ORAD2 region. A typical endometrioma measuring less than 10 centimeters, that's again an ORAD2 region. A simple paraovarian cyst of any size, or a two region. A peritoneal inclusion cyst, or a two. Hydrosapping, or a two. These are get giveaways. Again, if we go to aorta, these are all B features as well. Let's now move to ORAD3. The ORAD3 regions have got a 1 to 10% likelihood of being malignant. What are these regions? Any simple or non-simple cyst that is measuring more than 10 centimeters has got a likelihood of being malignant up to 10%. So we flag it as an ORAD3 region. Those typical classical benign lesions that we talked about, the hemorrhagic, the endometrioma, the demoid cyst, if they measure more than 10 centimeters, then they are also ORAD3. And unilocular cyst that has got irregular inner wall. So this is where now we go back to that definition of what's a papillary projection. 
Remember we said a papillary projection is any solid component from the cyst projecting into the, uh, from the cyst wall projecting into the cyst, measuring more than three, centimeters, three millimeters. So now when we have a solid projection from the cystic wall going into the cyst, but when you measure it's, it's less than three millimeters, then we just call that an irregularity of the cyst. So we'll describe that as an irregular inner wall of a cyst. We will not say there's a papillary projection. So a unilocular cyst with irregular inner wall, that is also an oral too, has got a possibility of one to 10% of being malignant. Multilocular cysts with smooth inner wall. In other words, multilocular cyst, but there is no any lesion on the cystic inner wall. If you put color and there is color score one to three, meaning there is no color or there is mild color, then you still flag that as an oral three lesion. If you've got a solid or a solid appearing lesion with smooth contours, whether it doesn't take color or not, you flag that as an ORAD3 region. What about ORADS4? The ORADS4 has got 10 to 50% uh, risk of me being malignant. Multilocular cyst with smooth inner wall, and it measures 10, more than 10 centimeters with the color score one to three. That's an all right four. Multilocular cyst with smooth inner wall, any size, but it's got a color score four. In other ways, it's got strong uptake of color on color Doppler. That's an, again an all right four region. A multilocular cyst with irregular inner wall. In other ways, it's got some solid issues on the inner wall, but when you measure them, they're less than three millimeters. Any size, any color score, if it's multilocular, then you give it an ORADS4. Then you've got an unilocular cyst with a solid component. In other words, what we call unilocular solid cystic lesion. Any size, any color score, they go in the ORADS4 category. Unilocular cyst with one to three papillary projections, whether that cyst measures five centimeters, whether it measures 10 centimeters, if it's got one to three papillary projections, whether it takes color or not, we still flag it as an ORADS4 cyst. <laughs> And then solid with smooth walls, but um, color score of two to three, again, we flag those as an ORADS4 region. What about ORADS5? The ones that have got more than 50% likelihood of being malignant. Well, if you've got a unilocular cyst with more than four papillary projections, so you've measured these papillary projection, it's more than three millimeters, and you've counted individually how many papillas are there, and there are more than four, then that's an all right five. There are three or two, an all right four region. Multilocular cyst, but it's got solid components, and it's got strong color uptake, Color score three and four, again, that's an all right five region. A solid lesion with smooth contours, but with very strong flow, an all right five region. Solid region or solid appearing lesion with irregular contours, any size, whether it takes color or not, you go ahead and flag that and as an ORADS-5. Just, just also to be careful that when we, are, we are flagged, when we are describing these regions, when it talks about irregularity, when it's a solid region, we look at the outer appearance of the solid. 
That logically makes sense. When you're talking of irregularity of a cystic lesion, we talk about the inner wall of the cyst. And if you're dealing with the cyst, and then there's also ascites or peritoneal nodes, again, you go ahead and flag that as an ORADS-5 lesion. So hopefully when we use this tomorrow morning, we've got a region and we apply these uh, classifications, we should be able to have a discrete route that we're going with the region, whether this is a malignant or whether that is a benign region. Just some cautions though, when it comes to using these uh, rules, whether it's the Yoda rules or whether it's the, uh, the ORAT, the rules does not replace training and experience in ultrasound. So at the end of the day, we still need good ultrasound training so that we can be able to partly recognize these regions and then categorize them as well. We also need good ultrasound equipment. Uh, the rules cannot compensate uh, for that as well. Uh, generally, most of these rules are done based on transvaginal scan. So be cautious when you use them on transabdominal. Of course, there are very few cases that you would use them on transabdominal if this maybe is a huge mass that you can't delineate well on TBS, uh, then obviously you would do a transabdominal. But generally speaking, what we've discussed is based on a transvaginal ultrasound. And these are recommendations. They are not uh, requirements. What do we mean by that? Well, you still have to take case by case. You still have to take primary history and obviously marry that. Because let's say you've got ascites, but there's no adnexial regions, and you know that ascites must be coming from somewhere else. Uh, or if you've got a patient, whether she's young, but she's got strong family history of, uh, of gynecological cancer, you would be careful with each mass that you find. Okay, so I just thought of throwing one case study uh, that I saw a couple of months ago. This was a young patient, a 20 year old, and she was symptomatic by the way, presenting with uh, low abdominal pain. Uh, she said she's a virgin. So because she told us she's a virgin, obviously we could not do uh, transvaginal. So we went ahead to do a transabdominal scan. We saw this lesion uh, in the right ovary. Look suspicious, but then you're dealing with a 20 year old. Uh, you'd be forced to think that no, there is no way a 20 year old would have a suspicious mass. But remember, diseases don't read books. So they, sometimes disease can confuse us. So with this mass, try to use the aura. As I say, that's what I normally use in my, in my data practice. This is a solid region, irregular. Try to put color, there was color uptake. So I gave it a color score three. Because I could not do transvaginal, I used the linear high frequency probe just to, to delineate the, the mass properly. And I fragged it as an ORADS four. Uh, well worried though, because I mean, this is a 20 year old and you would think, am I right? Uh, thankfully, the guys went in, removed the mass, and here is the, uh, the histopath report of this patient. It came in at a juvenile granulosa cell tumor, which is malignant tumor that is very, very, very rare, actually, only found in 2 to 8%. But because I use these classification that I've talked about. In other ways, I would have been fooled to think because it's a 20 year old, I think maybe it's a demo. But because I tried to use these simple rules, married them together with the ORADs, we were able to frag it and we were able to uh, tell them this is a highly suspicious 
malignant tumor. They went in, histopath confirmed our suspicions, and uh, the patient is now receiving uh, oncological treatment. So I hope with the few things that I've talked in this presentation, you should, going forward, should be able to uh, characterize uh, the adnexial regions that you meet in your daily practice. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chilipo, for the presentation. Uh, I think I can stop our recording here. Then, okay, request us to record. Okay, that's fine. Yes, so this was such a good presentation. Uh, you have solved one conundrum that I, I've always had. If you see a simple cyst uh, in the oval, which is probably, which we are also sure is just a physiological cyst, should you mention it in the conclusion or should you ignore it? So sometimes I would mention, sometimes I would.